In the gently rolling hills of north central Texas lies an incredible resource for people who want to get the most out of their horse and their discipline of choice. Training Resources is located in Sanger, Texas, just north of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. They offer decades of experience in training, lessons, showing, clinics, and consultations in multiple disciplines, including saddle seat, hunter pleasure, western pleasure, and driving. In driving, they have tremendous depth of experience in singles, pairs, and four-in hands in both pleasure driving and combined driving events. At Training Resources, their philosophy is simple. They want people to get the most out of their horse and their relationship with their horse. And whether they have aspirations of the brass ring and high-level competition or simply want a trail riding companion and friend, all clients and horses get the same high level of attention as a training resources client. Our training vision is uh, reaching the full potential of the horse through training and then uh, if amateurs uh, want to be involved to help them reach their full potential as horsemen and putting that package together and putting it in the show ring. If uh, amateurs don't want to show or if we have owners that uh, are interested in having their horse trained and promoted by us, we certainly do that too. We've scaled our operation down quite a bit so that we can uh, enjoy the uniqueness of being able to be hands-on ourselves. For the most part, uh, we work in a 12-horse barn and uh, that's the limit by stalls and we do our own work or we help each other do that work and in doing that although we've owned and worked in mega operations before we've come to appreciate the fact that if, if you get small enough you can be more hands-on to the horse which helps in an understanding of him and he of you and it also helps in that we can uh, be more hands-on with our customers in a more individualized program to help them improve their horsemanship and horsemanship needs. All right, as you get ready to begin uh, learning more about driving cones, you want to drive fast, but you've got to be accurate. Uh, there are some techniques that we're going to go through here that, that we know, they're proven, uh, will help you drive faster and more accurately. But before you watch this video, you would be doing yourself a big favor if you just went out, set up a cones course, and drove the course, ran a watch, and timed yourself. So I'm suggesting you do that. Go out, set up a course, uh, drive the course, and time yourself. And keep that time. Write it down someplace. And then after you've finished, uh, look at that time, and then I want you to drive the course again. And uh, after having watched this video, you can watch it several times if you if you like. And uh, then, using the techniques that you've learned, uh, I think you're going to find that uh, your drive, uh, after you've learned these techniques and committed them to memory, uh, they're going to make your drive smoother, faster, and more accurate. It's all about the sight line, it's about the bridge, it's certainly about the water hook, 
It's about tempo. When you put those techniques to work and you time it after you've done that, you're going to find that you left horse wrestling and you got into Cone's business. And that's what uh, we hope this will bring success in doing. Okay, we need to talk some about your strategy for driving a course. Your course is described by your course map. So when you get your map, and these are uh, handed out at various times prior to the class, uh, my strategy is this. I take the map and I just look at kind of where does it go? then I'd start to develop a strategy for driving that class that way. But I, uh, different people have visual attributes that are different. Mine are, mine are challenged is what they are. So I have to give myself as much help on a course diagram as I possibly can. So what I do is I look at it and I'll run my finger through it a couple of times. And then I'm going to want to do something different in order to make sense out of the path that I'm going to take. So what I do next, I'll show you. I take my course map and I draw my line on it so that I can run my finger on that line and know the course I'm going to take. And you can do this in different ways. Uh, I spend as much time as I need, but I might spend an hour just on my course. I want to know this well enough that by the time I am done studying the course that I can take my course, put my finger on start, and push through this thing without looking at it, doing it with my eyes closed. And then I know that I know my course. There's another way that you can approach this, some people do, is uh, this way you've always got one point of view. Some people say, I need the scope of the driver's point of view. So they'll put their finger here and go over here, then they will turn their map so that they've always got the next pair in front of them and how they're going to turn to get to that. And that works best for those people. They continually turn their map so that they're driving straight ahead. That doesn't work as well for me. But some people that works very well for. What I would recommend is that you at least draw your line so that you know Keeping red on the right is all about, and uh, so you don't get off course. And uh, it's a horrible thing to lose a class because you eliminate when you're off course. That isn't the idea of the sport. So that's the way, that's the strategy that I use when I get my course diagram, and that's how I attack it. I start with a plain course, and I look at it for scope and turning, and then I draw a line that follows the route and I study that. I do that until I can push my finger through that route with my eyes closed. Then I know I know it. Then the last thing you have to do is do your course walk. And uh, I can't imagine this, but some people actually uh, don't do the course walk. They do this. They hitch their horse, they go to the class, and they, and they drive the course. I, I could never do that. Uh, and I wouldn't recommend that you miss the course walk. Because on a course walk, you have to di uh, transfer from the diagram up to the reality of the course. And the course reality may be such that uh, I had a competition here recently where 
you had a nice diagram, you could figure very nicely a flow uh, for driving the course, but then when we got to the course walk, there were uh, arrangements of flowers set in what would be your line of sight from one cone to the other. So it totally altered the way you had to drive the course. If you don't do the course walk, you miss those things, you don't know, you're going to get lost, confused, go off course, eliminate all of those bad things. So course walk's very important. I spend as much time on the course walk as I possibly can. You start with a diagram, you do the line, you do the finger thing, then you go to the course walk, and at the course walk you really address the reality of, of, the, walk, of the course. So that's the point where you really decide, no, 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 it looked like a right turn on paper, but it's really a left turn in reality. So you have to make those adjustments. Always remember that on your course walk, you're probably going to have to make adjustments. There's nothing the matter with that. Uh, study that, get a plan in mind, go to the course walk thinking, I can't alter this, and sometimes you have to. Usually, you have to. That's uh, my strategy for the course walk. In this video, uh, we have the ability to demonstrate uh, two types of horses in the way they move. This is a Morgan mare, and uh, then there is a gypsy gelding. And they, uh, one is high energy, and one is low energy. Now, this is cones, so we're not rewarded for a horse that uh, it got its head up in the air and is collected and is doing a big trot. But a Morgan is naturally high-headed. A gypsy generally is not. So there are different types of horses. They all do cones. And we're going to talk about the differences. So here, if you're doing a high-energy horse, you have, to, you have to use your bridle a little differently. You want the bridle, and that means the leverage, you want that to accommodate the horse in a way that you have control, but that does not over collect the horse. You don't want that nose behind the vertical because you know from, from horse physiology that they don't like to step beyond the end of their nose. So if you leverage them behind the vertical, you shorten the stride. So over leveraging a horse is going to cost you speed. That's why you see one of these High energy horses go out there and he's traveling along and he looks really busy and fast. He's going laterally and doing all of this high energy stuff. And then you see the gelding uh, come along and he beats him. Well, the reason is because the gelding is more open. He's got a more open frame, a longer stride. Uh, he's not wasting any energy. This is about covering ground. So when you're doing cones with a high energy horse, you bridle to get control, and then you manage that control so that uh, you can restrict your speed but not over collect your horse. You can expect the horse to be quicker laterally because uh, he's high energy. Uh, and in doing that, in, in, in the lateral movement being fast, what you want to remember is that once you're in the course and you're trying, you know you're on the clock and speed's a, a factor, you tend to think, well, I gotta pull this horse hard right, hard left. That's wrong. What you have to do is you have to work your hands quickly. You want to think of your hands like being a, a piano player. They don't work hard, they just work fast. So when you're doing your lateral movement, you use your hands fast. The biggest thing that you've got to think about is the release because that's what makes everything worse, work. And work quickly, don't work hard. Then in your high energy horses, and we've talked about this before, but these are the horses that at the beginning of the workout, you have to walk them. And at the end of the workout, you have to walk them. Remember this about working a high energy horse. The next time you bring him out of the barn, he's going to remember how you put him away. So if you were trotting like crazy to the barn and you went to the wash rack and
put them away. Next time you come out, you harness him up, and he comes out of there, he's going to trot like crazy. So if you want him to come out quiet and easy, walk him. He'll remember the last thing you did, and that's how he'll come out of the barn the next time. So high-energy horses need to be walked. Another important element in driving cones is your sight line. You have a sight line on the course. You're sitting there in the cart behind the horse and you're looking at your cones as they come up, trying to remember your numbers and trying to keep cadence and doing all of those things. It's difficult, especially at, your, at the beginning of your career in doing cones, it's difficult not to look down at your cones. You can't do that. When you look down, you drop a shoulder, which drops a hand, which pulls you right into that cone. So you've got to look through the cones. You're much better off, really, if when you approach a pair of cones and you're, let's say, 10 or 15 feet away and you have your lineup already done and you're committed to it, then find your next pair before you ever go through that pair. That lengthening of your sight line will help your, your horse flow better through the course. And doing cones well is about flow. What you don't want to do is look down at the cones, as I said. Do not drive from cone to cone. Look through your course at the turns that are described to make an arc to complete your cones course accurately and let your horse cadence and flow through them. So you don't drive cone to cone, you don't look down, and then the only other thing you have to remember is when you drive through the set of cones, your horse is thinking, I'm through it, I'm done with it. He does, he's got blinkers on, he doesn't realize you've got a cart or a four-wheel vehicle back there that could be as much as 11 feet long that has to clear the cones too. So, you, the third element is you've got to keep your horse going in a, in a sufficient path that allows the vehicle to pass the cones. Don't look down at the cones. Don't drive cone to cone. Drive a flow. Look ahead. And give your vehicle time to pass through the cones before you change direction. That's the sight line for driving cones. There are a lot of techniques that you can use to help with accuracy and speed. We're going to talk here about an accuracy technique. You notice the hands and the reins going through them forming a bridge between the hands. Well, the bridge is a common way of holding hands to riding and driving. Uh, a lot of your driving people don't realize that this technique can be used in driving. And the way the bridge works is this. You form a rectangle that is described by your left hand, your right hand, the right side of the bit, the port of the bit, the left side of the bit, and the rein coming back to your left hand. So that rectangle, think of it as putting a rope around a tree. When you pull one side, you have to release the other. And in doing that, if you use this bridge, and it's necessary that you keep the bridge tight between your hands, you can't have a hump there, that communicates to the horse exactly what you're doing with both hands. So if you pull on the right rein to turn to the right, as in this path, then you have to loosen the left rein. And there's a left turn, now a right turn, and in using that bridge, you're communicating, and this is the key, you're communicating with both sides of the horse's mouth. And you aren't pulling one rein tighter than another. You aren't pulling one and slacking another the way you would if you drive with a rein in each hand. So this is the most efficient, most communicative way that you can drive a horse and 
Keep your reins doing what reins ought to do. Pull one, release the other. Release one, pull the other. This is, in that rectangle, a definite communication. We have another video in this series called Harnessing the Single Carriage Horse, and it deals specifically with fitting a harness and harness parts and their function, uh, and it gives great detail to that. But this video, doing cones, puts that function to work. So we've got to talk a little about these harness parts and what they do so that it makes sense to you when you're driving cones. Now there, there is a, an envelope that uh, the harness describes that the horse works in when it's doing whatever it's doing. That envelope is described by the breast collar right here and the britchin right here. How tight they are adjusted determines the amount of room that your horse has to work in the harness. So we need to uh, talk about that fit and what is right and what is wrong. The britchin tension is adjusted at the back by the holdback straps and their tension uh, around the shafts. So that's where you adjust that. Your breast collar, on the other hand, this is a quick hitch harness. It snaps in here at front. Uh, some other harnesses will buckle into the breast collar, but this snaps in here and then has adjustment holes back here to adjust the length of the trace. So when we get to talking about the envelope and how you adjust your horse uh, to fit in that envelope, we've got to talk about the adjustment from the standpoint of the trace, how tight or loose it is, and the holdback strap that goes around your shaft, how tight or loose that is. The measure, and uh, this has to do with function, the measure of that tension is described by when your breast collar is tight against the chest, and here this horse is standing, but you can see that there's, uh, there's no slack in this. Then you come back here, we want to have just enough slack behind the britchin that we can comfortably run our hand down through there. That size envelope, and here we're talking about the ideal, that size envelope gives this horse at an extended trot, enough room in this harness to extend and lengthen his body without being restricted by the harness. The harness parts that would restrict him being the breast collar and the breeching. So this envelope is tremendously important when you're fitting your harness to do the job you want to do. In combined driving, we tend to hitch our horses in shorter and tighter in carriage driving, we can allow them to be out further from the carriage and wider in the shafts and other things that are more relaxed. But in cones where lateral is important, you want your envelope to be tight enough that there's no slop and no slack, but long enough that the horse, when he lengthens his body, can lengthen it comfortably to get the stride, to get the speed to be productive and uh, efficient and hopefully a winner in counts. So the envelope that's described by the britchin and the breast collar, a very important fit when you're talking about being successful doing cones. When we begin the cones driving and we've worked on some basic skills of start, stop, turn, soften, bend, those kinds of things that are really better addressed in groundwork. We get the horse hitched and into a rhythm where he's comfortable. We get out on the cones course and if, you're, if your adrenaline doesn't elevate, there's probably something matter with you and there's probably something matter with your horse too. But the thing that you want to remember about turning through cones is that you've got two reins. They work independently of one another. And you've got to figure out, all right, how does this system work? Well, if you're going to make a left turn like this, you use a left rein to turn. 
in this case, right turn, then left turn again. So you're using a rain to turn. That's one of the elements. You've got another element that is just as important and often, very often, overlooked. You use a turn rein to tell your horse, I'm going to turn. Then you use the opposition rein, which in this case right now in this turn is the right rein, to tell your horse, how big is this circle going to be? So your left rein says to the horse, I'm turning left. Your right rein says, I'm turning in a circle this big. The two elements of making a turn is, number one, tell them with a turn rein that you're going to turn. That means point the bit where you're going. And then the other element is, you tell them how big that turn's going to be with the opposition rein. There you see a pretty good demonstration of that. That's how you make the turns. You start off by saying, I'm going to turn. And you follow that independently with, I'm going to make a circle this big. Know this about making a turn with a horse. When you point the bit, a horse cannot keep from going where you point the bit. It's not possible. So if you point the bit between the cones, he's going to go there unless you don't give him enough information. If you don't tell him of that opposition rein, we're going to turn this short, well then you've caused the mistake. It wasn't your horse because he's naturally going to go where you point the bit. So in doing the bending, two elements. Point the bit, says I'm going to turn. Use your opposition rein to say I'm going to turn this short. That will make your drive accurate and fast. The most important part of uh, accuracy in driving cones is to position your horse so that as you approach the cones, your horse and your turnout are in the middle. It's difficult for a lot of people to figure that out because they don't have a point of registry. Well, the water hook gives you that point of registry. And uh, we can get into the history of water hook at uh, from covered wagon days. It's not necessary. It's that little hook where if you had a check rein, you'd hook it. And we use the water hook as a point of registry because if you will drive your horse in your turnout in such a way that the water hook is in the middle, then when you approach the cones, you have a point of registry. Now, when I teach cones, here's what I tell people. There are two rules for driving cones. Put the water hook in the middle. That's rule number one. And uh, rule number two is when you approach the cones, you never slow your horse down. You either maintain your speed or speed up. So those are your choices. Number one, put the water hook in the middle. Now, if the water hook's not in the middle, don't be a little old lady on me. If it's not in the middle, put it in the middle. That's what the reins in your voice and your aids are for. So uh, the comment of, well, why'd you hit the cone? Well, it was, the water hook wasn't in the middle, but he wasn't going there. No, that doesn't cut it. Put the water hook in the middle. Then, secondly, as you approach, then you must either maintain your speed or increase your speed so that your horse doesn't lose lateral stability and drift into the cone. Those are the rules for the water hook. Well, there's another technique that we use when we're learning cones, and that's uh, uh, to coordinate yourself with what your horse is doing. 
If you go down to the music store and get one of these metronomes and they come in different shapes and sizes and costs and so on, and turn that metronome on and pin it on your shirt or stick it in your pocket and go out there and drive your cones course in such a way that you coordinate the strike of the feet with the metronome and then sit there and drive that course, listen to that metronome and strike a speed that number one works for your horse. If your metronome set too fast it won't work for your horse. If it's set too slow you're not aggressive enough to beat anybody. So as you work with this you develop a rhythm first. That's what a metronome is for. Match the strike of the feet to the strike of the metronome. And as you're driving your cones then you will develop a rhythm, a cadence. And it's called different things in different places. But rhythm, cadence, those are the things that make bending, turning, working your course work for your horse and for you. That way you don't rush here, too slow here, it doesn't vary and you aren't cranking in your horse's mouth. The first thing you do in teaching uh, your horse is to strike a regular cadence or rhythm that's best taught by using a metronome. If you get to that point and your horse is soft and quiet and going steady and you're working through the cones, well then you get to a point we talk in cone strategy about there's places in every course where you can speed up because you have straight distance to do it in and there's places where you have to slow down because you're making sharp turns. So once you graduate from the metronome to the course, you look at your course and say, all right, here I'm going to stay at about 14 kph. That's what my metronome strikes when I'm working at home. Then at this point, I've got a straightaway. I'm going to pick up speed here. So I'm going to deviate from the metronome strike. And then when you get into tight turns, uh, conversely, you, you drop your rhythm down so that you can make your sharp turns and not aggravate your horse's mouth. Think of those turns as having a glass of water. Every turn you make spills some water. If you've made too many turns, you're going to end up with a horse that is aggravated by the bit because you've overused it. So that's what the metronome does. It teaches your horse to relax, to work at a rhythm, and then from that rhythm you make deviations when you can speed up for a straightaway, you deviate down from when you have to slow down to make a series of hard turns. Metronome is worth the investment. It will help your technique. When you're driving cones, you're not always driving on a flat surface in an arena. Sometimes you're out in a pasture. Uh, I've seen cones courses set up uh, with a creek in the middle and hills on both sides. So it's not always flat. How do you accommodate the hills? Well, here's a demonstration of accommodating the hills. Practice in a place, and this is about a 15 meter circle here, where the horse is going up and down hill and turning. So set up a couple of cones, sets of cones like this, and practice this. You need to know that this is a super putting the water hook in the middle because if you don't, the horse is uh, going to fall in because you went too slow on your approach. So when you're going particularly downhill and around a turn, your horse is going to drop the inside shoulder in. That's a natural thing for a horse to do. And right there's what happened. When you see that he nicked that cone, that horse slowed down going up that hill. And when he did, the shoulder fell in and the horse drifted to the left and hit the cone. When there, see, too slow, he slowed down, hit the cone. That's the thing that happens in a cone's course and that's why putting the water hook in the middle, you maintain the speed and you put the water hook in the middle. If you slow your speed, your horse is going to always lose lateral stability and he's going to drop a shoulder. If you want to carry this over into dressage, 
it works the same way. If you're trying to make a 10 meter circle and your horse is misshaping his shoulder, it's because you've allowed him to slow down and he's going to drop a shoulder or have a shoulder fall in and your circle will become small. The fix is always add engagement, add engagement. That will cause your speed to pick up and that will allow your horse to maintain the shape of his shoulder. If you've used all of the aids that you can, uh, voice, whip, everything, and it's still failing, you can do what we professional trainers do and sick the dog on the horse. But those are the considerations when you're working on a hill. You've got to beware of a shoulder falling in. The fix is engagement. Uh, there will be times when you're practicing cones, which is one of the more fun spark, sports in, in carriage driving, where you're going to hit a cone, it's going to fall over. All right, here's what you do when you are building back sanity. Teach your horse to stop and stand. You'll learn to use that whip to get off and reset there, because it, it substitutes for getting off and resetting the cone. But then. More importantly, you see how we're just going along here, we're still driving cones, we're walking and going easy. That's something that you occasionally do to measure the sanity of your horse. If you don't do that occasionally, then you can't speed up again like this and, uh, and keep your horse's sanity. He'll get what we call gamey. And when they get gamey, they just want to go fast and do cones and not think and then pretty soon you have a horse that's out of control. So your measure always on that is to stop your horse, let him stand, or just walk cones and let them soften up and you see where they are mentally. Then if they're okay, you come back like we are here, work for speed, and uh, continue building your technique. But no cone set driving is worthwhile if you lose your horse mentally. So if you don't do the walking and you don't do the stopping, you can't measure it. And then it's too late. You've got a horse that's eyes are spinning when you're trying to do dressage and that doesn't usually work out very well. Do some walking. There's a couple more points that we need to address when we're talking about doing cones. Cones is a speed class. There are, are other speed classes and speed sports. And there is always a controversy that comes up over whether or not you should sharpshoe your horse. So I'm going to address it. Some people don't want to. Some people have miscon misconstrued conceptions of, of what it is and does. Borium, that's these dots right here on a shoe, or drill tech, which is what this actually is, puts a hard spot on a shoe that when it hits the ground, sticks the shoe there, no matter what the surface is. So if you're in deep mud, now your borium isn't going to help you so much, but if you're on, like in Texas, we get grass, but our ground is dry, so our grass is slippery, uh, borium helps with that or if you're on any kind of or crossing a hard surface, uh, borium helps stick the shoe. And people say, well, one argument is, well, if you have borium on there and the shoe strikes the ground and the leg sticks, that you throw torque up the leg and through the joints, which is damaging. Uh, I've been doing horses all my life and I'm old. So I've seen a lot of horses in situations where they slip. Now if you think that the shoe hitting the ground and sticking and throwing torque up a leg is bad, then you need to watch a shoe without borium that hits the ground and slides and that horse does a split. Then you've done immeasurable damage to your horse in terms of his, of his physical being. You've also done damage to his mental being because he loses confidence in what he's doing. So we shoe, my recommendation is, we shoe with borium so that when the shoe hits the ground it sticks. 
If you're going cross country with a horse on dry grass on a day like today in Texas or anywhere else, and that shoe hits and it just slips a couple inches. Well, you take that times an 800 meter cones course or a marathon and look how much distance you've lost. So, put the Borium on, my recommendation. Then when the shoe hits and it sticks, it doesn't slip. The horse is more confident with his work and more willing to do it because he has more trust in his equipment, an important thing. So that's why we shoe with Borium, and I recommend you do too. Another uh, aspect of equipment that you need to address when you're talking about speed courses is the leverage that the bit puts on your horse. You want, if you've got a horse that's very forward, you want to have enough leverage that you can control your horse uh, from a runaway or from excessive speed or speed that is detrimental to your performance. So uh, the Liverpool style bit, this glory bit kind of demonstrates that. You've got a ring, you could put your rein around here or you could put it here or you could put it in the rough cheek which is through that ring or you could put it through the first drop or the second drop. So you have all of those positions of leverage to work with and that's what makes the Liverpool style of bit such a nice driving bit because you can, you, can, you can offer excessive leverage, just a little bit of leverage or no leverage or other grades in between. Here's a misconception. You're in a cones course it is judged on speed. A misconception is, well I want my horse to look good even though we're just doing a speed class. So you bridle him all up so he can be collected, and stay on the vertical or behind it, and his head's elevated. And so that's great for a working class or a turnout class, somewhat in rainsmanship, your rail classes. If you're into speed, you don't want to do any leverage that limits your horse's ability to lengthen. So it's not about how collected and pretty he is, it's about how fast he goes and doesn't hit anything. So if I am doing a rail class and I was using this bit, I'd probably use some leverage. If I'm doing a speed class and I have total control of this horse in a very soft way, I do no leverage. Someplace in there, you've got to decide what works best for your horse. And the lever bit gives you the ability to regulate that. The misconception that the horse has to look good in a speed class is wrong. The horse has to be fast, which means he has to be able to lengthen his body, uh, lengthen his stride, and cover ground. Can't do that when he's levered back. So take that into consideration when you're bridling your horse uh, for a speed class versus a rail class. Well, all right, we're done with all of this. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope uh, we don't do these videos to entertain people. We do them to be instructional. That's our goal. I hope this helped you with that. There's one other element of this that ought to be addressed before we close, and that's that uh, if you're going to drive, you're going to make an investment in a vehicle, and harness, and uh, you've already got a horse, hopefully, or that too. So we are training resources, and uh, the resource part of this is that we can help you find the right harness and the right vehicle uh, for your uh, type of horse and uh, the sport that you want to enter, whether it be carriage driving or whether it be combined driving. Uh, those sports uh, require different harness, uh, different styles, uh, horses have size, and I think the, the biggest thing that me, we can maybe help you with is, as uh, Joe Paterno from Penn State says, we, we just want to protect ourselves from the long pass. Well, if you go out and buy a cart and a harness and bring your horse and come to the farm and the harness is a fine harness, uh, not a carriage harness, well, you're already behind the eight ball. And then if your if 
cart is for a draft horse and your horse is 14-3, uh, that isn't going to work. So these are big investments and you can spend a lot of money and if you do it wrong, you make mistakes. We just want to protect you from making mistakes that are costly and uh, we're glad to share the information with you to prevent that. So if you need equipment, call us and we'll help you find it.